so when we talk of a newborn or a neonate we mean the first 28 days of life that means the first 4 weeks post neonatal that means you know what is infancy some definitions which are used so neonate means first 4 weeks or 28 days and in post neonate means from the neonatal period till infancy that means from 29 days till 365 days perinatal means the period in the immediate from the intrauterine period when the baby was viable that means from 22nd weeks or roughly 500 grams till less than 7 days now why we have taken this perinatal period is because a lot of children die in the perinatal period so it's not only after birth a lot of there are a lot of still births also in india so children who are dying after the age of viability also we would like to see why they are dying so they have common causes so that is why we take a period that is known as perinatal period that is from 22 weeks of intrauterine life that means 500 g from when the baby was viable till 7 days of post neonatal period what is a live birth live birth is any baby or any product of conception whether it was 500 g or 600 g after he was separated from the mother the baby showed signs of life right it may not be a viable fetus or maybe if sometimes it's only 450 g so we are not talking of gestation here we are not talking of weight but the baby was separated the product of conception was separated and it showed some signs of life in the form of a heart rate or an activity or umbilical cord pulsation fetal death means after separation from the mother there was no sign of life here again we are not talking about gestation but when we talk of fetal death and stillbirth this is a difference stillbirth means it was a baby was born dead but the baby was viable right so it was more than 22 weeks more than 500 g and the baby died in the intrauterine period or during the birth process and after birth it did not show any signs of life but if it was alive it it was viable right now we keep on using the term full term baby pre term baby and post term baby so you know that you must have studied in gynae a little bit about term we start calculating the first day of the babies from the from the period of lmp that is the last menstrual period so that is actually the gold standard from which we calculate the gestation so we we assume that a full term baby is roughly around 40 weeks 9 months and 7 days so if a baby is beyond 37 weeks for example you have taken the lmp whatever the lmp was and you have taken that the edd or the expected gest uh, expected date of delivery was say it was 20, 30th of uh, september so 3 weeks prior to that that means at 37 completed weeks the baby is full term now why we want to differentiate a preterm and a full term is because we assume that uh, when we say 40 weeks you know that uh, people there's a in every every natural thing there is a time range right for example your height everybody is not going to be of the same height these are going to have a range some will be slightly shorter some will be slightly taller similarly when we talk of gestation everybody is not going to be delivered on the exactly 40 weeks so some will be delivered a little pre prior and some will be delivered a little late but those babies who after birth will not require any intervention that means all their organs are mature got it brain everything you know that a baby has to develop completely in the intrauterine period so if a baby is complete has completed 37 weeks he is not likely to require any intervention that means his brain his intestines his lungs they are mature that is 37 completed weeks right from 37 weeks till 41 weeks and 6 days that is term if he is 42 weeks and plus then it is called post term got it so if he has 37 30 he is completed 41 weeks and 5 days he is full term if he has completed 42 weeks and 1 day he is post term again post term is has some certain other complication because the placenta is known to support the baby till 40 weeks beyond which the placenta is not able to support the baby completely so they have they may have retardation the liker may reduce they may not withstand the stress of labor so post term babies have a different set of who's a pre term baby a pre term baby who has not completed 37 weeks that means less than 37 weeks is called pre term that also 34 weeks to 34 to 36 weeks is late pre term they are less likely to have serious complication less than 34 have more serious complication so they are known as early pre term so when these are certain terms that we keep on using full term pre term post term right so what is full term 
So it's not exactly only 40 weeks. It's a range from 37 till less than 42 weeks. More than 42 is post term. Less than 37 is pre term. Then again, these are certain terms to use. We use low birth weight. So what is the normal birth weight of a baby? So normal birth weight is 2.5 to 4 kg. So in India, the average weight is around 2.8 or 2.9 kg. We have That is the average weight of the Indian babies. Less than 2.5 kg is low birth weight. Right? Less than 1.5 is very low birth weight. Less than 1 kg is extreme low birth weight. Right? So, so normal birth weight is 2.5 to 4. 2.5 to 1.5 will be low birth weight. 1 to 1.5 is very low birth weight and less than 1 kg is extreme low birth weight because they have a very they have so many complications. Now again when we talk of death, we talk of giving what kind of neonatal care you have, the kind of health services you have. So we use certain indices. If you have got very good health services, you will be able to save most of the people who can be saved. Right? So certain indices which are used to assess your health parameters. One of them is NMR and PNMR. So you must have studied that, okay, the NMR this year has gone up, the NMR has gone down. And even uh, Modi ji says, we have, a, we, have a very, we, very, we have an NMR, very high NMR of about 28 to 32 in India. And uh, our Prime Minister has a very ambitious target that by 2030, we should have single digit neonatal mortality. That means around 9 to 10. So that is the level. And in certain states like Kerala, they, the neonatal mortality is around 12. So they have almost reached that target. Not because they are rich, but because they are giving better access to healthcare. So that is the target. That means if you are able to salvage every child who can be salvaged, that means you are giving good neonatal care, you are giving good medical care, good health facilities are available. This is very important for our state because we are one of the highest NMR states. Right? And it is one of the states where the NMR has actually increased. We were actually doing better than the national average, but in the post-COVID era, we found that our NMR had increased as compared to the national average. So again, that is something which we are not proud of. Then we talk of perinatal deaths. Perinatal means the new perinatal means stillbirth from 22 weeks in the first seven days, and that is calculated by the ratio of 1,000 live births. Have you read these ratios and rates in uh, community medicine? Have you been taught these things? So you'll keep on coming across them and this is something as an Aiki community medicine will and you come and forget this in pediatrics because this is going to be there and even uh, simple laymen, a lot of journalists, if you talk to them, everybody knows. And as doctors, you have to know what they are trying to say. For that, you have to know what they are talking of. So they are talking of death of a newborn per 1,000 live births, right? So we find that out of all the new people, children who die, so we have a very high under 5 mortality rate. Compared to all the countries in the world, we are a developing country. Why? Not because uh, we are not earning well, we don't have a very big budget, we don't have a good GDP. Because of a lot of these health indices, they are also taken in consideration. right? And these are not doing very well. So we are not able to salvage every person who can be saved. And one of the indices is how, what kind of neonatal care that you are giving. Out of 1,000 live births in a developed country, they will be able to, in their country, maybe 7 or 8 are dying in a country like Canada. But in our country, out of that 7 or 8, 30 children are dying. So you understand the level of healthcare, the difference that you have. So if you are born there, you have a much greater chance of survival. Why? Are not because uh, like Indians are more, they have more diseases. Because we are not able to save every child because we don't, they don't have access to good healthcare. So we have a lot of children who are dying. Out of all the children less than 5 years of age who die, so you know till 5 years you have how many months? 60 months. Out of all the children who die, 65% die in the first one month. So you understand the importance of this neonatal period? It has very high mortality. Out of the 65, 45% die in the first 7 days. So when we talk of the neonatal period, we call it early neonatal period, that is the first 7 days. And from 8 days till 28 days, that is called the late unit period. So because, why? Because out of all the children who are dying, roughly 50% are dying in the first 7 days. Out of that also, roughly 50% die in the first 24 weeks. So the chance of dying is highest in the first 1 day, then the first 1 week, and then in the first 1 month. And a lot of children are dying in this period. That's why we focus and we 
you can imagine 69 percent of all the under five deaths are in this period that means it requires a lot of intervention you have to understand this period nicely only if you understand this nicely probably you can do something about it why do children die so many of them are too small too small means low birth weight they are born preterm preterm means less than 37 weeks and the third reason is asphyxia asphyxia means they are born they are not able to establish respiration and we are not able to give them resuscitation so out of these you can't do much about prematurity or low birth weight but you can if they are dying because of infections or asphyxia you can salvage these children by giving them proper neonatal care so what are the interventions that we would like to do the interventions that we want to do is early breastfeeding we check their weight we prevent hypothermia by maintaining a warm chain we do a good clinical examination so that we can find out any problems that they have and remedy them at, properly and we screen for malformations. So once a baby is born, right, as soon as the baby is born, what do we do? If the baby is full term, now here we are not going to talk about the care of preterm, the care of children who are asphyxiated, that we will teach you in subsequent lecture. So here we are going to just tell you the care of eye, cord and skin. That means a full term baby is crying lustily. So, out of all the children who are born, 85% of children cry immediately after birth. So, in that case, what do you do? You deliver the baby onto the mother's abdomen. And when do we cut the cord? We cut the cord a little delayed. We cut the cord after 1 to 3 minutes. Right? Why do we cut the cord? Initially, what we were doing is, uh, 1 or 2 years back, we used to cut the cord immediately. But what happens is, the placenta is still circulating blood. So if you cut the cord a little later, you give the baby a little extra amount of blood, right? And what does that do? It prevents iron deficiency later on. So the iron reserves are, the last a little longer, so the baby doesn't become anemic at 3 to 6 months. So that is the advantage of doing delayed cord clamping. And you can do it only if the baby doesn't have to be separated from the mother. So what we do is, as soon as the baby is born, we deliver the baby onto the mother's abdomen. So the baby receives warm from the mother. The mother's temperature is 37.5. So the baby is on top of the mother's abdomen. You dry the baby. And if you find secretions, you wipe them. Then you do delayed cord clamping. And you shift the baby for skin to skin contact between the mother's breast. Right? What about the eyes, cord and skin? So if a baby is full term, baby is crying, you can just wipe the eyes with sterile normal saline. They don't, we don't have to instill antibiotic drops. What about the cord? We cut the cord up. I told you we do delayed cord cutting. That means after 1 to 3 minutes. And where do we cut the cord? We cut it at a distance of roughly 2 fingers or 2 centimeters from the stump. Now why do we take this 2 centimeters difference? Because sometimes the lower part of the cord can have a little part of the intestine. You must have studied anatomy. So you know that a part of the, initially when the child is developing, the, the part of vital intestinal duct or part of the intestine may lie in the lower part of the intestine. So we cut it at a distance of 2 cm. And we don't apply anything over the cord. So the cord is cut, you clamp it, we have these uh, clamps, disposable uh, clamps which are available and we do not apply anything over the cord. What about the skin? We just wipe the skin gently with a pre-dried linen. We don't try to rub, we don't apply oil, we just keep the skin clean. Then as soon as the baby is born, you shift the baby in between the mother's breast, you give zero dose of polio and we give vitamin K to every child. Right? So why are we giving vitamin K? It prevents hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Because mother's milk does not contain a lot of vitamin K. So deficiency of vitamin A, K causes HDN or hemorrhagic disease of newborn. So every newborn who is delivered in a hospital, even if he is fully healthy, is given vitamin K. So the dose is 1, uh, one milligram for a child who is more than 1 kg and 0.5 milligram for a child who is less than 1 kg. Then you have delivered the baby on the mother's abdomen and you look at these things. You look at the breathing, you look at the temperature and you look at the color. So what are you looking in the breathing? We are looking for if the child is crying lustily. That means... He has got good breathing. If the child is having grunting, grunting means a kind of, the parents say it's karahana, uh, uh, this kind of sound, right? It's kind of grunting. So that indicates respiratory distress. So if a child is grunting, that means the child is having distress. 
If the child is breathing quietly or the child is crying, that means the breathing is okay. Then we look for chest in drawing. Normally when you inspire, how does your chest move? It moves out. Right? You take a deep inspiration, the chest is going to move out. But if the chest moves in during inspiration, that is called chest in drawing and that is a sign of distress. Then warmth, you look at the temperatures. Actually we are supposed to record the temperature of every baby within half an hour. But what you can also do is, bedside that we do is, we touch up, we use our hands to test the temperature. So whenever we handle a newborn, we should always be doing hand washing, right? Then with the dorsum of the hand, we touch the trunk and we touch the extremities. If both of them are warm, then the baby is having normal body temperature. If the trunk is warm but the hands and feet are cold, that means the child is in cold stress. That means you have to warm the baby. You should put the baby, should the baby should be given cap and mittens and should be roomed in with the mother, KMC. If the temperature of the, if both the trunk and the extremities are cold, that means the child is having moderate to severe hypothermia. So that child will require ICU admission. Right? So the, on, in day to day practice, when you are just seeing a baby in the hospital, you can use the fingers or your hands to test the temperature by touching the trunk and the extremities. Both of them are warm means normal body temperature. If only the extremities are cold and the trunk is warm, cold stress. They will respond very well to if you clothe them and you give kangaroo's mother care, you room in the baby with the mother, skin to skin contact with the mother, you will be able to maintain temperature. But if both of them are cold, that is moderate to severe hypothermia, these children are have a very high chance of mortality. So they should be shifted to a NIC. Then color. Ideally, this is the part of the, the lips and we look at the lips and we look at the extremities. Right? So after first few minutes, that is after 10 to 15 minutes, both of them should be pink. In the initial few minutes, about 8 to 10 minutes, we find that the tongue will be pink, but the extremities will be blue. What is that called? When only the peripheries are blue. Acrosinosis or peripheral sinusis. If you visited a hill station when it's snowing, if you've gone to Nenital or Vintal when it's snowing, you must have seen, because of peripheral vasoconstriction, you'll find that even your hands will become blue. So that is because of peripheral vasoconstriction, right? So that is acrosinosis. But if a child's lips and tongue are also blue, that is central sinusis. And that is also, that is always a dangerous sign. But if only the extremities are blue, then it is peripheral sinusis. Then you need to rewarm the baby. <coughs> now we are talking about breastfeeding. Now this is one of the very important interventions which can save lives. It's something so natural, every mother has milk, right? But still you will find that a lot of parents are giving top feeding. And a lot of mothers need lactational support. You can't say, it is all hai. A lot of educated mothers, uneducated mothers are going to need help with lactation because for the first baby, they may need, they may not know how to latch, how to position. If they know how to feed their baby, the best milk for a baby, for a baby is naturally the mother's milk. If a baby begins to feed nicely, the mother will produce a lot of milk and the baby will remain healthy. If she is not able to latch, she is not able to feed, she will give the child top feed and the child will keep on coming to you sometimes for diarrhea, sometimes with meningitis, sometimes with pneumonia, right? So this is a very simple thing and we, do just, we just assume that everybody knows but it's not true. We find that a lot of mothers, she may be highly educated, she may be completely uneducated and you will find that every mother may need help, right? So what you have to see is when you are breastfeeding, as a doctor, you have to help them. You have to know that the mother has to be comfortable when she's feeding. That's why in one of the competencies for your semester is breastfeeding. Because it's something which is very, uh, like it's so important and then we keep on wondering why in a country like India, why so many people are giving top feeds. Because mothers were not able to latch on, they slowly, slowly they lose confidence, the child is not growing and she feels, okay, my child is not gaining weight, she starts giving top feeds. With a little bit of support probably, she could have just continued breastfeeding and the baby would have remained healthy, right? So we try to see that the mother is sitting comfortably. When the baby is latching, he's opening his wide mouth, or his mouth should be wide open, right? His chin should be touching the mother's breast, the body should be in one plane, the chest should be touching the mother's abdomen. So this is something that you will see in your clinics. So if the baby is having good attachment, the, the good latching, with a little bit of lactational support, you will find every mother can breastfeed. There's nothing like lactation failure 
if you have helped the mother because the most potent stimulus for feeding is for milk production is sucking if the baby is sucking effectively he is emptying the breast there is no mother who will not produce milk whether she is thin or fat she is young or old there is nothing like lactation failure if she is motivated and there is good lactation then i told you about warm chain right so warm chain means your delivery room should be warm so what is the temperature of the delivery room you expect so for india it's not very difficult to maintain it's 25 to 28 so it's only in the winter season that you have to do something about it otherwise this temperature is not very difficult to maintain in a country like ours but yes in the hill stations in the hilly terrain again you may have to give blowers or heaters to maintain the temperature and whenever you receive the baby you receive a baby in pre warmed linen you are not receiving the baby in a cold cloth the doors and windows of the delivery room should be closed if there's a cold wind coming you put the ac on the fan is blowing then the child will become cold so whenever you are conducting the delivery the fan switches ac they should be off the windows should be closed the delivery room temperature should be 25 to 28 and you should receive the baby in a warmed cloth right then you deliver the baby on the mother's abdomen and you remove the wet linen after you shift the baby between the mother's breast you put the you put the baby or your cap and you put mittens then you cover the baby and mother with a blanket so the baby is inside the delivery room for 1 hour and he is maintaining temperature then whenever you shift a baby for example you have to shift a baby to snci or nicu is small so it's ideally good to shift the baby in a transport incubator where you can maintain the temperature then again maintaining the delivery room temp maintaining the temperature in the postnatal ward how do you maintain the temperature again by seeing that the windows are closed and uh, like the, if you see in the station people give very thick uh, sweaters so what what would you like the parents they should give a single thick layer or two or three layers of clothing layering you always prefer layering we prefer two or three layers because you know that between the layers you trap air and the air is a insulator so child if you have a thick single layer of a sweater that contains a lot of uh, i mean it's not going to have a lot of air in between a single thick layer will maintain the temperature to a lesser extent than three or four layers of simple cotton clothing right apart from that the head is a very used surface area so we always want the head covered with a cap and the feet and hands covered with socks or mittens we just tell them simple socks that you can buy you can just put them on the hands and feet and a cap and two or three layers of simple clothes then hand washing so before you handle the baby or anybody handles the baby or a mother is doing some household chores or cleaning we have to advise them about hand washing because sepsis is one of the important causes of death so does anyone know the steps of hand washing oti vagare jaate ho tum log have you gone to the operation theater you been asked to scrub at any place you don't have oti you don't have oti visits operation theater wale gaye ho kabhi so it does not sister doesn't tell you to scrub and go inside so actually there are certain uh, steps of hand washing anyone so we this is a simple uh, acronym that is used that is suman k right so this is what we use to teach even healthcare workers and you can remember that also so ideally when you are hand washing with soap and water you should take at least 1 minute even if you are using a hand rub you should take 30 to 45 seconds theek hai do bond hand rub nahi dalna you have to have adequate quantity of soap or adequate quantity of hand wash hand rub also so that you can touch all the surfaces so what we do is we do five times seedha s means seedha 1 2 3 4 5 5 got it then u five times ulta for one hand five times five times for the other hand then s u i i for interdigital got it this is interdigital then m for mutthi so 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 right a for angootha right so five times right and five times left angootha n for nails 5 5 and k for kalai that is wrist then you wash your hands and you air dry it or use a single dry towel so that is s u i m a n k anyone ab bol sakte ho anyone can tell me bol batao see 
Ulta, Ulta, Inter Digital, Mutti M, S U I M A N, M for Mutti, A for Anguta, N for Nails, K for Kalai. So you have to remember all these steps and you wash properly five five times before you touch a baby. So whenever you are touch, touching a baby, your hands should be clean. The cord should be clean. You are not. Are you applying anything over the cord? No. The cord is kept dry. Then whatever you are cutting the cord with, we use the we use disposable or autoclaved uh, syringes or a disposable blade. Then the cord tie should be clean. The clamp is usually disposable. If you don't have disposable cord, what you can do is you can use rubber band which are dipped in for six hours in Sidex or Savlon. So the cord tie should be clean. Then the surface should be clean. Whenever the delivery is being conducted, the surface should be clean, right? Surrounding should be clean and exclusive breastfeeding. So these are the hygiene principles. What about taking a bath? A lot of parents will ask you. Ask you all also. Our baby has delivery. We are nehla ding. So what? What do you tell them? So we tell them that we do not advise a bath in the hospital because children tend to get cold. They become hypothermic, and you are not able to maintain the temperature, right? So what we tell them is, you give the baby a sponge bath. You just wipe the baby daily with lukewarm water and a cloth till the cord falls off. When does the cord fall off? So this is what you have to know. So this is something which is going to happen in a normal baby, roughly seven to ten days. So the cord falls off in seven to ten days. After that, they can give the baby a bath, and that is at home, not in the hospital. Okay. And when they are giving a bath, it should not be in the open. There is a tendency here in the hills. I have seen they tend to give the baby a bath in the sun. क्या होता है सनलाइट इज नॉट वेरी नॉट इनफ टू गिव द बेबी वॉम बट द एयर इज ब्लोइंग ठीक है विंड है इट्स वेरी विंडी सो द बेबी बिकम्स हाइपोथर्मिक आफ्टर द बाथ सनली दिन सब सुबह चीक का नहलाया एंड द चाइल्ड बिकेम ब्लू सो देवर गिविंग द बेबी अ बाथ इन द कोर्ट यार्ड वेर अ प्रॉपर स्ट्रॉन्ग विंड वॉज ग्लोइंग एंड अ वेरी स्मॉल अमाउंट ऑफ सनलाइट सो यू टेल दैम टू गिव द बेबी वेन एवर दे गिविंग अ बाथ इट शुड बी इन अ ड्रॉट फ्री एरिया वेर देर इज नो विंड बेटर टू गिव इन डोज द वॉटर शुड बी लूक वॉम द क्लोथ शुड बी ड्राई Right? You give the baby a bath fast, put the baby with dry clothes, breastfeed, and keep the baby with the mother, so that with the baby and mother together they can maintain temperature. Right? And that is given only at home after the cord falls off. Again, what about uh, like usually after a baby is born, they pass stool very frequently. So this is another complaint the parents will keep coming to you. Now, sab dud pita hai, lechen karta hai, dud pita. So actually they have a you, they have a gastrocolic reflex. One thing you must have studied in physiology. So every time you know that peristalsis is stimulated whenever the part of the gut is stimulated. So whenever there is abdominal distension, that is gastric distension, there is a colic reflex. So in the newborn period, it is exaggerated, and slowly you will find that initially what happens for the first one month, the child feeds and they pass through. So but it is not sufficient to cause dehydration. Child will keep on passing a small quantity of stool. It's not very watery. But the baby baby passes a lot of urine also. The baby is feeding well. The activity is good, so you know it's gastrocolic. But if the child is feeding once and passing three or four liquid stools and appearing dehydrated, that means it's loose stool or sepsis. Okay. Yeah. So now you have to differentiate. A parent comes to you, okay, say he's saying that sir, subha se das das toh gaye. Look at the baby. He's crying lustily. He's drinking. He's passing a lot of urine. You know it's gastrocolic. The baby is passing stool. The baby is dehydrated, lethargic. That means it's sepsis. So, taking a good history and examination will tell you whether it's gastrocolic or it is infection. Then, what about it? The child it has to be clean, cleaned. Why? Because a lot of parents will say he cleans, he's passing stool so many times they just wipe it off. So, if a stool remains in the perianal area and then the child passes urine, so you know a lot of bacteria they contain the enzyme urease. As soon as urease is mixed with ammonia, there will be a lot of ammonia which is generated and there will be ammonical dermatitis. So, the entire perianal area will become red. ठीक है, so they say that's a bit they dust करें and the entire area has become red and inflamed. so you have to tell them to clean it properly with soap and water or even with water or wipe with clean cloth which is which has water so that stool doesn't remain there. otherwise stool with a urea will cause ammonical dermatitis. then when you are screening, what are you screening a baby? you are looking for dysmorphic faces. so you have some children who have got Down syndrome. they have got epicanthal folds or a high arched palate or low set ears or Polydactyly, so they've got some malformations. If a child has got one malformation, the chances of having other internal anomalies like a heart defect or a kidney disease are more. So 
every child should be screened for these anomalies so that you know what problem the baby is having. Right? Then we do a pulse oximetry. I'll tell you about that. Then we look, we, we screen each and every child for jaundice. So how do we look for jaundice? So we take our thumb and we press it over the bony surface, over the over the uh, forehead, then over the chin, then over the chest, the abdomen, the thighs, and then over the palm and sole. So we know that every newborn is going to have some degree of jaundice. That's called physiological jaundice. Now why does this happen is because the hemoglobin of the baby is more than that of an adult. Right? The adult has, the hemoglobin is roughly 11-12. The baby has a hemoglobin of 16. Our RBCs have a lifespan of about 120 days. Their RBCs have a lifespan of 90 days. Our liver is able to take up all that bilirubin which is being formed and conjugated and excreted in stool. But the baby's liver is not so mature. So what happens is all children will develop some degree of jaundice. But usually that jaundice is not severe enough to cause any defect. That means the problem with jaundice is when it rises beyond a certain level, it crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets deposited in the brain causing carnictus. So we just want to screen that level which is going to damage the baby. Knowing fully well that every baby is going to have some degree of jaundice. So if it is only in the face, it's about 5. We are not so worried. If it's in the upper chest, it's around 8 to 10. We are not so worried. If it reaches a trunk, again it's 10 to 12. Now we are a little worried. If it reaches a thigh, it's usually beyond 12. So you get a bilirubin level done. Beyond 15, you have to give phototherapy. If it reaches a palm and sole, it's definitely pathological. Right? So you're screening every child for jaundice. Again, if a child is jaundiced in the first 24 hours, it's always pathological. So if it's physiological, it will start appearing beyond first day. It will appear on day 2, day 3. It will be mild. Right? So if jaundice is appearing on day 1, then it is pathological. If it is very severe, if it is reaching the palm and sole, it is pathological. Right? If it is not, then you are just going to scream. Then DDH, I'll tell you about this. And i am just got some pictures here also. So this is pulse oximetry. So you know that in the intrauterine period, the baby has a oxygenation or SpO2 of about 65. At about 10 minutes, the saturation of the baby reaches 85 to 95. Right? So what we are doing is, we are touching, we are we attach a pulse oximeter to the right hand and one of the lower limbs. If the saturation beyond the first 10, um, 10 uh, minutes of life is less than 90%, then you would like to go in for a echocardiography. Or the difference in saturation between the upper and the lower limb is more than 2%. Have you seen a pulse oximeter? Now whenever you talk of vitals, Right? Whenever you are examining the vitals of a person, of a patient, what are the vitals? TPR, BP. Temperature, pulse, respiration and blood pressure. These are vitals here. So whenever you examine a patient, you examine the vitals. Now the fifth vital is pulse oximetry. It is widely accepted because it's now since the time of COVID, everybody has a pulse oximeter. So you also examine the pulse oximeter. So if the saturation is less than 90 or the difference in upper and lower limb is more than 2%, then the child is said to have an abnormal pulse oximetry reading and this child should be screened for a heart disease. So this is a transcutaneous bilirubinometer. This is non-invasive. So this is how you are screening. Right? If you don't have a transcutaneous bilirubinometer, we just examine by skin, by looking at the skin, by blanching. This is... DDH, developmental dysplasia of the hip. This is Ortolanis and Barlow's maneuver. You know that some children will have developmental dysplasia of the hip. Now, what happens is the head of the femur in some children is not well formed. Right? You know, ideally, the femur should be inside the head. It should be inside the hip bone. But now sometimes what happens is because this hip is not, the upper end of the femur is not formed, it is display or it is displaced laterally. It is displaced outside. Now what happens is, the child is going to start walking at the age of one year. So if you don't screen these children, they will not be diagnosed till one year of age. If the, the problem is, if you diagnose it in the immediate neonatal period, you shift, you, you displace the head back, right? The bone or the limb will grow normally. And if you don't do this, the femur will, the head of the femur will not grow. There will be secondary fibrotic changes. And if you diagnose it late, the child will walk forever with a limp. 
तो सर्टेन थिंग हैव टू बी स्क्रीन एंड द पेरेंट्स में नॉट नो द डिफरेंस थोड़ा सा डिफरेंस होता है अपर लेफ्ट राइट एंड लेफ्ट में द पेरेंट्स में नॉट बी सो इंटेलिजेंट दे में नॉट बी इवन अ डॉक्टर कैन मिस दीज थिंग्स और पेरेंट्स इज डेफिनेटली गोइंग टू मिस इट सो अनलेस एंड अंटिल यू आर लुकिंग फॉर दिस थिंग द बेबी इज गोइंग टू स्टार्ट वर्किंग एट वन टू वन एंड हाफ मंथ वन वन ईयर ट्वेल्व मंथ थर्टीन मंथ फोर्टीन मंथ बाय दैट टाइम यू डोंट वॉन्ट हिम टू लिव फॉर अ लाइफ टाइम फॉर समथिंग विच इज इजिली ट्रीटेबल यू आर स्क्रीनिंग फॉर डेवलपमेंटल डिस्प्लेज ऑफ हिप In ortholanis maneuver, what you do is it is usually used for a hip which is out. Have you been taught this in ortho? Right? No. So you'll be taught this in orthopedics also. DDH is taught there. Here I'm just teaching you the screening. In this, what you do is you put your hand over the greater trochanter and you have your thumb inside the thigh. If the thumb is dislocated and you just put it like this, there will be a clunk sound and the hip will come inside. Right? So that is known as Ortolani's maneuver, and that is positive only when the hip is displaced. Barlow's maneuver is called telescope test. In this case, the hip is not displaced, but it is dislocatable. It's not dislocated, but it has a high likelihood of dislocation. So you put the hip like this from the top, and you push it back. So if if it hip moves out with a clunk, that means it's dislocatable. It's not dislocated. It's dislocatable. So in both of these cases, you have to put a splint, and you have to do certain other interventions. Which will prevent fibrosis and secondary changes, so that surgical procedures may take may take or may be, be taken care of later, but the child will have at least normal limb growth and will not have a limb. So these are red eye reflex for hearing, and every child is screened for hearing. Why? Because the child will speak only as much as he hears. So the problem is that if you diagnose a child who doesn't who is not able to hear. to be able to diagnose him by 3 to 6 months and you put a cochlear implant or you put a hearing aid by 6 months by 2 years he'll be speaking like a normal child to diagnose this child at 2 years at 5 years he'll be speaking only 8 to 10 words because language develops in the first 2 years of life theek hai the brain both maximum brain growth is occurring in the first 2 years of life so you want to screen them so that you can diagnose them timely because intervention ka bhi ek time frame hai Diagnose a child with hearing deficit. You put a hearing aid at six months. He is going to have absolutely normal IQ. If he is not, if you diagnose the child at four to five years, he will be able to speak only a few words. Okay, and a child who is speaking, he could have become a doctor or an engineer. Now he is going to find it difficult to pass even class two. So you can understand why screening, why all these things are important. Then you examine for malformation. For example, this child here in this picture, he's got, he's got cleft palate. You screen for hypothyroidism. Again, hypothyroidism is very important because every week that you, every month that you delay, you reduce the IQ by four points. So if you diagnose the, again, hypothyroid, thyroid is very important for brain growth. To diagnose the child at one month, you diagnose the child at three months. At three months, his IQ will have reduced by twelve to fifteen points. So, just by checking IQ hundred only, it will become eighty-five. At hundred, he could have become a doctor. At eighty-five, he will not be able to pass even class ten. You understand the importance of screening. Now there are certain harmful practices which we discourage. One is pre-lactal feeds. This is very common here. A lot of parents give shed. A lot of parents give tea. A lot of parents give other things, which is to be discouraged because not only does it cause infection, it also hampers establishment of lactation. Massage. We are very fond of massage. Malish. Okay. A lot of people will have pe malish people coming to their homes. Massage is encouraged, but it should be gentle and it should be with those oil which are non-irritant, like MCT oil or olive oil or coconut oil. Mustard oil is a irritant, and vigorous massage sometimes causes fracture of the clavicle, dislocation of the hip. So we don't want a vigorous massage which will damage the skin. It can be gentle massage with a non-irritant oil. Then we have this habit of putting a lot of oil in the nostrils and nose. This is to be discouraged because it causes aspiration pneumonia. Sometimes we put so much oil that it trickles down and causes lipoid pneumonia. Then cow dung. Again, that is not to be encouraged because it contains a lot of tetanus spores. It's infected. Then again, kajal. You can tell them to apply a dot here, but not in the eyes, because again that causes infections. These are certain normal things parents will keep coming to you with. They'll keep on coming. That's a little, little. My child, my child, milk is coming out, milk is coming out. So that's very normal. That's called posetting. But with that, the child will continue to gain weight. Okay, if a child is not gaining weight, then it's not normal. Stool frequency. Initially, the child passes stool after every feed. That's gastrocolic. Then it the child passes stool every three to four days. That's also normal. then jaundice i told you every child will have some jaundice but it will appear beyond the second day it will not touch the palm and sole and it will reduce by 10 to 14 days 
if it's occurring on the palm and sole if it's occurring on day one then it's not normal and the urine should never be yellow that means it's a cold uric indirect jaundice some hiccups sneezing and yawning is normal excessive crying the children don't have a normal sleep pattern so a lot of parents will come to you that sab raat mein sota nahi hai so that's very normal till 3 to 4 months a child will not have a particular sleep or day rhythm so that's very normal evening colic is usually because of a lot of distension of the abdomen because of improper feeding so you tell them proper burping then there are certain problems that a child parents will complain about excessive sleeping right so again excessive sleeping we are not so worried about sleeping children sleep to about 16 to 18 hours but they should be in between they should be feeding 8 to 10 times in a day and they should be accepting feeds well then mastitis neonatorum i'll show you i've got some pictures of this then mucoid vaginal secretion so a lot of maternal hormones so mother has got at the end of pregnancy she's got a lot of estrogen and progesterone so all these secretions will cause a lot of some some it may cause vaginal bleeding in the small female child so for the first 7 to 8 days or 10 days because of these passage of these hormones the baby may have a small amount of vaginal bleeding so what you have to tell the parents is that the baby will eliminate these hormones you just have to maintain local hygiene with normal soap and water right then obstructed nasolacrimal duct so some of the parents will normally tears are formed after the first one month of life if a child is having watering from the eyes it is usually because of the obstructed nasolacrimal duct so what do we do for that so we don't do syringing in a newborn we studied of thal what they do is syringing if you have visited of thal but in a newborn we just tell them eye massage so what we tell them is every time a mother feeds she washes her hand and she massages the nasolacrimal duct five times from top to bottom right then umbilical granuloma so sometimes the cord falls off and there's a small red tissue there so if it's umbilical granuloma and you're sure about it then you just cauterize it with copper sulfate or salt now this is a scalp swelling right so this is also a very common thing that occurs it can occur because of two reason one is caput the other is cephalhematoma so you must have studied this in applied anatomy but the snails no because this was one of the expected questions in anatomy that's what i remember when they teach you the layers of the scalp so you know caput why does caput occur caput occurs whenever a baby goes into obstructed labor a mother is has gone into labor and the baby gets obstructed for some time right so because of gravity some amount of edema develops in the subcutaneous plane so it's in the subcutaneous plane there's nothing wrong with the baby right so that is cephalhema caput and it disappears in 2 to 3 days so you get a history that the mother had the second stage was prolonged kafi der lagi thi ra sab something like that right and you know that it is in subcutaneous plane so it crosses the midline cephalhematoma occurs in the subperiosteal tissue so you know that here in the newborn the periosteum is around the bones because the bones are not that huge so cephalhematoma is usually tense and it will not cross the midline and it is a collection of blood again for a cephalhematoma cephalhematoma there will be history of either forceps delivery or a ventus delivery some invasive delivery you will get that kind of a history again the cephalhematoma also the management is conservative you are not going to take that blood out but sometimes with the cephalhematoma because you know how does this blood disappear from the body blood is actually then later on converted to bilirubin so some of these children may develop prolonged jaundice and some of these children may also be having fracture of the skull suppose if it was a very forceful delivery then there may be some fracture of the skull may be associated but if you look at them caput will disappear in 2 to 3 days cephal hematoma is going to take 3 to 6 months to 3 to 6 weeks to disappear because the body has to clear it slowly so you have to just tell the parents even if it is cephal hematoma that they have to bring the child frequently to look for jaundice if he develops jaundice which is severe then you give phototherapy but otherwise this is going to disappear naturally it has to take its own time it's going to take 3 to 6 weeks you have to just counsel them so by proper examination you can differentiate and these are very common findings now who are the children who come to you as a normal newborn but they will require immediate management so newborns are very fragile sometimes i've seen a patient comes to you and they say doctor sir mera bachcha jo hai doodh nahi pee raha hai so if a mother is complaining of not feeding well always take it seriously because by the time he comes to you the next day he may be in shock or he may be in gasping because newborns are very fragile 
So what are the danger signs? You are looking for jaundice. I told you most of the children will have some jaundice. But if the jaundice is in the palm and sole, that means that child definitely requires treatment. Sinuses. Which kind of sinuses is always dangerous? Central. If the lips and tongue are blue, either it's a sinotic heart or respiratory failure, it's always serious. Abnormal movements. Child is having jerky movements like this. It could be a seizure. Child is lethargic. Now this is something which is very difficult to assess. Parents are saying, Dasa, my child is very sick. But if the mother is saying, Dasa, I was drinking good water today, I was not drinking. Always take it seriously because she is the one who is there with the baby. So you say, no, I feel good. So don't assume that you know too much. Sometimes the mother knows more. Again, respiratory rate. Now we have, for you all, what is your respiratory rate? It's around 14 to 18. But for a newborn, till two months of age, a respiratory rate of up to 60 is normal. So when the rate is more than 60, or there is chest indrawing or retractions, that is a sign of distress, right? Then again, fever or hypothermia. Again, sometimes in sepsis, children will have hypothermia or they will have fever. Again, fever is a sign of sepsis and usually you have, in, in newborns, we have to give IV antibiotics much more frequently than that of an adult. आपको बुखार है आप तीन दिन है यू वी इन एन ओल्डर चाइल्ड वी से वायरल है आप तीन दिन है पैरासिटामोल लीजिए नहीं होगा तो आइए बट इन अ न्यूबॉर्न यस फीवर वी इन्वेस्टिगेट एंड वी वी हैव टू स्टार्ट इंटरवेंशन विद इन सिक्स टू सेवन आवर्स बिकॉज ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स मे बी टू लेट ठीक है सो फीवर हाइपोथर्मिया जॉन्डिस दीज आर द डेंजर साइंस इफ चाइल्ड कम्स टू यू विद दीज एंड यू से द चाइल्ड इज ओके यू मे लूज दैट चाइल्ड आई गॉट इट सो दीज डेंजर साइंस आर नेवर टू बी मिस्ड before you discharge, you screen every child for malformations, right? Screen for all these problems that we have seen. What are the vaccines that a newborn should have received? At the time of birth, BCG, OPV and zero dose of, first dose of hepatitis B. So these three doses the baby must have received. Then if a child is having any specific complaint, then you are looking for that. And you, what do you tell them? Exclusive breastfeeding. How to maintain temperature, how to maintain hygiene. Because these are the things by which children die. You tell every parent, agar haath paon pure, because you have discharged the child on day two. Maybe it will have jaundice on day four, day five, day six. You have never told him come back for jaundice. He's not going to come back. You say, agar bachcha haath paon pili lagay, to ab turant aiye. Doodh nahi piye to laiye. If the child is looking, sign knows, meela dikta hai, saans lene mein dikkat hai. So these are the danger signs that you must tell every newborn so that they can come to you immediately. So, which child can be discharged? Who's a normal newborn? So, do you if normally the mother will come to you and say, "Rasa, मुझे तो दूध ही नहीं हो रहा है." So, what do you tell them? दूध नहीं हो रहा है तो थोड़ा सा ऊपर का दूध दे दीजिए, थोड़ा सा गाय का दूध दे. What will you tell them? That's what is happening a lot nowadays. So, you know that the mother is not going to have a lot of milk in the first two days. So, you tell them feed very frequently. If she keeps on feeding frequently. It's a demand supply thing. Jitna zyada bachcha suck karega, utna zyada dood hooga. If you give top feed or you give pre-lactyl, you are inhibiting this cycle. You have given the child top feed two times also. The child is not going to suck. Naturally, the mother is not going to have milk. So you have created a problem for future. So whatever be the milk, you can tell them to keep on feeding the baby and that this much milk is sufficient for the baby knowing that by day three, if the baby keeps on sucking, the mother is going to produce ample amount of milk. Okay? So, this is what you have to advise. And after that, the baby should feed at least eight times in 24 hours. The baby should be feeding well. He should be vaccinated. He should have passed. When do you expect the baby to pass stool and urine? By which time should he have passed meconium? If the baby comes to you on day two and he says, that's why my child has not passed stool pass one time. Will you be worried? Yes. So baby should pass meconium within the first 24 hours and urine within the first 48 hours. Okay, because if they don't pass stool, then there could be a kabhi kabhi to imperforate anus hoga, which is very easily visible. Or there could be a slightly higher anorectal malformation. In which case, you have to do a early colostomy or an early operation. If they keep on feeding the baby and niche is obstructed, what will happen? The abdomen will get distended. Chances of survival will be low. So immediately you will screen the baby for a imperforate anus or an anorectal malformation if he does not pass stool within 24 hours. They don't pass urine within 48 hours, you are again worried. Okay? 
What about feeding? What are the recommendations for feeding? Exclusive breastfeeding, full term, preterm, any baby. You're not going to advise drop feed. It is only exclusive breastfeeding till six months and continued breastfeeding till two years. Okay. So, any intervention that we talk, which was very invasive or expensive or tough, simple things like hand washing, maintaining temperature, breastfeeding, and taking care of the baby, and just screening, observing. This is what you are doing. Right? You are telling every mother to maintain hygiene, to maintain temperature, do exclusive breastfeeding. Then you are looking at all these things. You are looking if a child is passing urine, he is passing stool, he is not developing jaundice, not developing cyanosis, not developing distress. So you are just screening. Now, none of these intervention is expensive, doesn't require a lot of money. But it can save a lot of newborns.